Maddie Le Buchan Benson has taken her experiences working with incarcerated young Aboriginal men and she's put them to paper. Her time with them informs her graphic novel. It is called The Outside Circle and it's a tale about two brothers, Pete and Joey, and the path toward healing that they both faced. And Patty Labucan Benson joins us now in our studio. Hi. Hi. Welcome to Toronto. Thank you. Um, set this one up for me. Tell me what's the premise of your book. The idea about this book is to um, talk about a young Aboriginal gang affiliated man who lives in Edmonton and he goes through a transformation. The book is about uh, healing, it's about transformation and it's about changing men of stone into men of grace, men who are kind and gentle. It really is about healing. And why'd you want to write it? Well I've been working at Native Counseling Services of Alberta for 20 years, so I started when I was 12. And I decided that I wanted to um, really capture a story that is not often told, not understood by Canadians, about what the, where these men come from and what can be done. Where is the hope and where is the future of this population of people? Okay, we're going to talk about more about your work in a bit. Okay. But in the book, so it's about Pete and Joey. Yeah. Two brothers. Tell me about them. Okay. Who are Pete and Joey? So Pete and Joey are, they live in the inner city of Edmonton. They've grown up in uh, serious poverty. Their mother is, uh, has a hard life. Uh, when we meet her, she is addicted to crack. And um, she lives with a man who is not very nice. And Pete is in the process of jumping into a gang. So he's, his affiliation is becoming set down. And uh, some things happen. He winds up uh, shooting his stepfather. And he gets put into jail. His younger brother, Joey, winds up in child welfare and his mom is left homeless. Real story? It's a composite, but absolutely it's the truth. This is what's going on right now. Hmm. So you pulled people, you know, a prototype of, yeah. of the people that you've worked it's with. It's a composite of many different people that we've worked with. And so I did, uh, not only have I overseen the In Search of a Warrior program, which we'll talk about, but I, um, I also did my PhD looking at warrior participants. So I took my dissertation findings, and when I was encouraged to publish, I thought that I just didn't want to speak to other academics anymore. I wanted to push this conversation out to a broader audience. And so we decided to do the graphic novel. And why the graphic novel? Because that's an interesting choice, right? Yeah. We, you could have told the story many ways. Why a graphic novel? Well, there's two reasons. Number one is I wanted to hit a younger audience. I don't want, I and other people don't want another generation of Canadians growing up, not understanding our history, not understanding what's going on and why it's going on. So this is a really kind of fresh medium uh, young boys like it, you know, I wanted a, a younger population. Mm. But on top of that, what it's turned out to be is very uh, accessible and anybody can pick it up and read it in an hour, an hour and a half and have the full impact of the story. The other thing about graphic novels is they're illustrated and so we could do some things like the mask that you, we couldn't do with a regular book and we can kind of unfold this um, spiritual transformation, this uh, the, the development of a positive identity and use this visual image of a mask through mm. the story to show that. Um, I want to bring up, we're going to bring up I think two or three um, sure. um, drawings from your book. So they're done by an artist named Kelly Mellings. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so let's bring that first one out and just if you can just walk us through these. What are we looking at here? Okay, so the idea of this picture was um, we were, I, I've done a lot of research on how it is that young Aboriginal men are gang affiliated. And this research looks at all of our colonial history from 1763 to the colonial history of nation building, to residential schools, to forced welfare, to the mass um, apprehension of children by provincial child welfare systems, to gang affiliation and crime. And so what I, the idea here is that young Aboriginal gang affiliated men are bleeding colonial legislation. That's the idea is to talk about how this gang tattoo the symbol of gangs. This is really about historic trauma and it is about colonization. Okay, let's bring that up again if we can. Can we pop that one up again? Because I just want our audience to see there. So it says Indian Act all, all yep. through some of the tattoo. Yep. Um, it, it talks about all these things that you through, through right. the process of the years That's that right. various people have gone through. In the rivers of blood of that tattoo that he really is bleeding this legislation that we have to look to our past to understand how come young men would choose this violent, horrible lifestyle over anything else that's offered to them. I'm going to ask you that question okay. in a bit. Okay, but let's keep going through these photo, uh, these drawings. Let's bring the next one up. All right, so there's the mask. That's right. Okay. Okay, so that mask, as we see it there, is a mask of rage. Um, 
in the in the in search of a warrior program we look at this concept that anger is a gift from the creator anger is something that helps motivate us to change but rage is this untethered free floating anger that causes uh, people to lose control and it causes violence and so that mask is supposed to represent that rage and we use that mask to show a, the difference in his spirit right and who he is as a man. It's really about his identity. So that when he's doing things at the beginning of the book that are violent and awful, he has this mask of rage. It's, who he, it's this um, identity that he has as a violent man. And then we see this mask, you saw in that picture, it, it breaks apart. And then at one critical point in the book, he has an opportunity to um, ground himself in a positive identity. And that mask changes to represent what that identity is. Okay, let's bring up our third picture here. Drawing, I should say, yeah. not picture. There it is. So there it is. Yeah. There's his mask. And that is representing Pete as a protector, as a provider, a person who has a positive sense of self, who has connected to who he is as an Aboriginal man. And that picture of a bear is, um, is a representation of his spirit. Mm. I'm going to pick up on something from our fo first photo, the one with the, all, all, yeah. all the different things. And so it shows Pete's um, bleeding arm, mm -hmm. different legacies um, mm -hmm. through Canada's relationship um, with Aboriginal people, residential schools, the Indian Act. There's one up there, the 60 Scoop. Right. I think most Canadians don't, don't know what that is. So it. most have at least heard okay. of the Indian Act and the, res the legacies of the reg residential school experience. Tell me about the 60 Scoop. So... Um, my understanding of the 60s scoop is that residential schools began to be closed in the 1950s. You know, it was an experiment by the Canadian government that children would be taken away, they'd be separated from their language, culture and spirituality, and they'd be assimilated into European or Canadian values. And in the 50s, the government decided that this experiment just wasn't working. It wasn't having the outcome that they wanted. Let's just and, remind our viewers that the last right. residential school just closed a few years ago. Yeah, in 1996, yep. exactly. But they started to close then. So in the 50s, there was no children on the child welfare caseloads because they were all, Aboriginal children were in these residential schools. But as they closed, um, the next wave of assimilation was the idea that we would place Aboriginal children in good white homes and they would leave their Indian identity behind and they'd learn to be good Canadian citizens. And so um, they refer to it as a 60s scoop because child welfare would come to reserves and they'd apprehend children by the busloads. So they'd fill busloads of children and they'd take them away. And back then child welfare was a closed book, so p children didn't have an opportunity to ever learn who their biological parents were. They were scattered all over Canada. Some were um, sold to the United States, some were used as laborers. So when they refer to it as a scoop, it was about this mass apprehension. And when you say the word apprehension, you mean they were, they were physically taken Forcefully. against the protest, in many cases, most cases, right. of their parents. And there's a, there's a section of the book that does go through that and talk about how absolutely painful mm. and traumatic it was for people to lose their children and to be, have them taken away, all, child, all your children, apprehended at once. Gotcha. You know, cutting the children out of the family unit. Why do you think we don't know this part of our history? Well, it's just not taught in our high schools. Mm. You know, we, uh, this is not embedded in Canadian curriculum yet. It's a paucity of our education that I had to do a PhD and focus on this as one of my areas of study to understand Canadian history. That's, that's half the reason I wrote this book. I want young people to know our history. Mm. Okay, so um, Pete's Joey in the book, yep. um, he gets sent into foster care. He does. Okay, um, so, so Make the time link for me, and we we're talking about the 60s and how children are apprehended and, and put into right. care. Right. Um, now, in 2015... Our stats are even worse. Okay, in so throw them. Do you know them? I yeah. do know okay, our stats. Give them to me. So the National Household Survey said that 50% of all the children in care across Canada are Aboriginal. 50, 50%. Five zero. Yep. In Alberta, it's 68.7% of all children in care are Aboriginal. We're apprehending children more than we ever have now. And so Joey's a representation of what's going on right now. And we juxtaposed in the book Pete's incarceration and Joey's apprehension and in a group home to show that they were feeling exactly the same. Hmm. You know, One was in prison, one was in a group home, but they both felt disconnected. They were lonely. They were completely away from their family. And they felt very hopeless at that point. Okay, Patty, so this is the, the shared experience. Two brothers, different situations physically, but same emotional and That's mental right. experiences for them. I want to bring in the Aboriginal aspect into okay. this because if we just use the stats, which is 50% of uh, kids in care are Aboriginal, that means 50% are not. Just explain the, 
don't know if it's the word is a difference between yeah. what Aboriginal kids in care would go through versus non-Aboriginal kids. So I think the difference is is that we're, we need to look at um, apprehension and incarceration from a historic trauma perspective. And so um, one of the most devastating effects of colonization for Aboriginal people has been the internalization of negative stereotypes of Aboriginal people that, that exist in Canada right now. And so um, in academia we call that a colonized psyche, but what, what that really means is that they've, the internalization that to have an Indian identity, to be an Aboriginal person, is to have an inferior identity. Many Aboriginal people have a deep sense of shame about their Aboriginal identity, and they've picked this up from the general, you know, from what they see on TV, mm. what, they, what they experience in the Canadian public, and this deep sense of shame is connected to an, a, a, a disconnect from who they are as Aboriginal people. And then when we look at the experience of residential schools and the damaging of the family unit and the apprehension of children, you have disconnected um, people who have grown up with hopelessness, helplessness, and powerlessness. And I think that's what's going on. I know that's what's going on for Joey and Pete in those segments, is this deep sense of hopelessness and helplessness, inability to change their situation. So here are these kids. Because um, they are kids, essentially. They're they are. They're young, they're young men. Um, and they're feeling um, dislocated, disassociated, disillusioned. Absolutely. There's no real great future in their own heads or probably for them in a lot of practical ways as well, potentially. Mm -hmm. And some of them turn to gangs. How, how does that transition happen? So if, you, if, we, if we leave children to grow up feeling hopeless about their future, that they have nothing to look forward to, and helpless to make a change in that, and they've grown up in family environments where their parents have been very hopeless, and they feel absolutely powerless when it comes to anybody with authority, like the police, like child welfare, like doctors, like crown prosecutors. Teachers. When, I teachers, mean, all yeah. of that. When you, when you grow up hopeless and helpless, it stands to reason that a, a young person would look to a gang to have a sense of power, to um, gain respect. I mean, in a really tragic, violent kind of environment, but at least they are self-determining their own future to some degree, right? It's mm -hmm. not great. So when we see Pete at the beginning of the book, he's trying to be a protector and a provider for his family. Yes, he's gang affiliated. Sure, he's running kids out on the streets for drugs, but his whole goal is to take care of Joey in that sparse apartment. You know, he goes back and he um, brings Joey a, a video game and they play video games and sleep on the floor. He's still trying to do what he's supposed to do, but he's got no good information and no options. He doesn't see any choice in his life at all. I want to see if you have another stat here. Because, um, and, well, help me out with this one. Okay. How many young Aboriginal men are ending up going through our criminal justice system? Well, I can tell you, in 1999, the federal prison population, 12% of it was Aboriginal. In March uh, 31st, 2015, 24% of the total federal prison population is Aboriginal, a full quarter. Whereas Aboriginal people make up 4.5% of our Canadian population, we are experiencing a crisis of overrepresentation. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we um, Aboriginal people represent 46% of all self-injury in prison, which talks to these really serious mental health issues of the people who are going to prison that are not being addressed. Okay, if we've gone from 12% to 24% in, in just over um, some numbers, your short time span, what the heck is going on here? Well, we're not... Uh, so if we know, and we do know, that crime and criminal behavior and gang affiliation is related to historic trauma, obviously we're not addressing historic trauma factors in prison. We are not effectively rehabilitating. It's really interesting that the biggest predictor of incarceration for Aboriginal people right now is past incarceration. It's a cycle of incarceration. Is so, that true of everyone in terms of incarceration? You apply no, to different communities? No. Not, that's my understanding, it's not. But it is one of our biggest predictors. And so we are not addressing, we're not rehabilitating people when they go to jail. And they are coming back into jail in a cyclical manner. Okay, this is a good segue into the work um, that you do with Aboriginal men mm -hmm. because, um, well, it's called uh, it's called the Warrior Program. That's right. Okay, so what are the guiding principles of the program? So there's three things. First of all, we are reconnecting men to a positive sense of Aboriginal identity. We're dealing with all of that shame, all of those negative stereotypes. We're reconnecting them to um, not to the culture, to the ceremony 
if they want. You know, it's not that we are converting anybody, but we offer them an opportunity to see what it means to see a really beautiful, flexible, positive Aboriginal identity. Then the, third thing, the second thing that we do is we work on reconciliation. And we encourage them not only to reconcile their relationship with themselves and maybe with, the, with their creator, but also with their family. We help them to look at their family relationships and what happened. We build this whole backstory of colonization, residential schools, their own family trauma. And we talk about the importance of family relationships. And then we help them. And this is a very experiential kind of kinesthetic, um, slow unfolding, peeling back the layers of the onion, kind of exposing what's going on. It's done within safety, with kindness and What is respect. it, counseling? No, it's a group. It's group yeah. work. It's group work. It is, um, it's not therapy. It's just, it's a process where of learning and exploring and um, experiencing, and it's all grounded in ceremony. And then the third thing that we do is help them to self-determine good decisions. So any healing program has to be a self-determined process. Nobody can heal me, I have to heal myself. And so our facilitators walk beside these men, help them to see that they have choices in their life, but the healing journey is all their own. They have to own it and they have to do it. Okay, take, just take us through the process. So okay. I'm a young Aboriginal man, mm -hmm. um, I commit offense, I'm, I'm, yep. co I'm convicted, yep. I'm sentenced to jail or prison time. Right. Where does your program come in, at, come in at this point? Okay, so we run a, a, an institution. We run a healing center called the Stan Daniels Healing Center. It's in the middle of Edmonton, inner city. And uh, men who are incarcerated, they go through the federal prison system and they come to our place kind of at the end of their sentence, right? Uh, we have a relationship with the federal government where we're given the opportunity to run our own jail, set our own policies, as long as we follow the laws of Canada. It's called a Section 81 facility. And so um, they would come to, to the Stan Daniels Healing Center and they would start the, the warrior program. It's a six weeks, six week intensive program. It's, um, it's very difficult to explain except that we do have sessions. So we look at abandonment, we look at neglect, we look at family trees, we talk about um, some things that people would expect in a violent offender healing program, but it is guided by the elders, which is different, and it is completely um, grounded in ceremony. And uh, so a lot of the traditional teachings are taught by elders in ceremonies. And giving people an opportunity to experience these teachings, to understand um, the nature of their relationships and how their relationships should look and what the values that guide those relationships mm -hmm. are, that's all done in ceremony. And so um, I'm not trying to say that they are forced to do this because we, have had, we do have people who are Christians, people who are atheists, agnostics, whatever, you know, and other people who want to explore traditional spirituality. What we do is offer them an opportunity to experience something different about being an Aboriginal person, to experience this ceremony and to um, debunk all the myths and negative stereotypes about ceremonies and just to present it to them as an opportunity. Debunk some of those. Of the myths, well, you know, it's interesting. In, in many projects, research that I've done, I've worked with people who, um, uh, before they started a healing journey, they heard nothing but negativity about Aboriginal ceremonies, that they were witchcraft or voodoo or heathen or pagan or whatever you wanna, whatever those negative stereotypes are. And one of the most powerful things that um, our elders do that work with us is they kind of unpack this, um, spiritual divide and we do a lot of reconciliation you know many of the elders come from the perspective that we all pray to the same God so whether you go to church to pray to God or you go to a sweat or you go to a temple or whatever we're just praying to the same God mm. and it's all good and if you want to pray with us here you can if you'd prefer to go to the church down the street you're you're free to do that too no women this is a program exclusively for young men okay so at the Stan Daniels Healing Center we do the in search of your War warrior program for men we opened the very first Section 81 facility for women recently, three years ago, and we have a program called the Spirit of a Warrior for Women. So it was adapted for women, mm. just as successful. What's the difference in terms of approach? Well, it's women-centered. Um, we talk about some of the very unique experiences that Aboriginal women face, being women who are really at the bottom of the social totem pole, as we would say. Um, and we honor those experiences of being women 
and the losses that some women experience around um, perhaps abortions or um, you know having their children apprehended and it's very women focused women centered okay here's the big question that everyone wants to know sounds nice patty mm -hmm. what's the effect what's the effect on the recidivism yep. rate well, I can tell you that the Correctional Services of Canada did a review of the In Search of Your Warrior program some years ago and found that it was wildly more effective than any program offered for in the mainstream Correctional Services Canada programs. I can tell you that at the Stan Daniels Healing Centre, we have enjoyed some of the lowest recidivism and reincarceration rates across Canada of any institution. Um, and I know anecdotally that what we do works. I know that men feel supported are in a safe place, do their work. We also do job skills training. We do all of that stuff. Our goal is to release men with a month's rent, a damage deposit in the bank, and some job skills, and some he a healing journey to rely on when they leave our jail. We know that um, when people leave gangs, mm -hmm. different kinds of gangs, yep. um, and try to go on a better path in life, and let's just use the example that you're talking about here. They're in a safe environment for a yep. number of weeks and then they're set forth. And what often happens is you retreat basically right. back drinking. There's pressure to come back. So is there blowback from, from the gangs that you've seen? Okay, so yes, there's pressure from the gangs to come back and you can't dismiss that, I, I would agree. But more importantly, getting a job, feeding yourself, um, dealing with the racism that Aboriginal people face every single day in mainstream Canadian society, dealing with all of that stuff in my mind is more difficult than dealing with the gang issue. To me it's a fallback because having a job, keeping a job, all of these things are difficult when you are visibly Aboriginal, um, have a, a criminal history, have just been released from jail. This is why I was saying that the em employment stuff is just as important as the healing stuff. We need to help um, create this environment and this skill set to help these men um, be able to wa um, keep a crime-free lifestyle. Do you have a story that stands out for you of someone who's gone through this program and, and has totally. changed their ways? I have a story that maybe is a little bit different, but it really speaks to the Stan Daniels Healing Center. There's an individual who came to us after he was incarcerated for 46 years. He, 46 years? 46 years. So he was... Um, he uh, was convicted of a murder that is still up in the air as to whether he really did it, but then committed another murder inside that he absolutely did. So he is a lifer, he's never ever gonna get out, right? So um, he, ha he came to us after being incarcerated for such a long time, and he went through the warrior program. And afterwards, we, we did a video with him and all of this stuff, and he said that he had never ever been treated in a friendly manner with kindness until he came to Stan Daniels. And he, it would caught him off guard. And he felt at first that he was being set up in some way. It took him a long time and through this program, and he talked about the power of the mask in the program and how he really learned a lot about himself. And so he still stayed with us. And, he, and every, time he, um, every time he gets out of the parole board would give him a parole, he wanted to come back because he says that the Stan Daniels Healing Center is his family. Hmm. And recently he developed cancer, he's in his 70s, and he asked the CEO if he could stay until he died because he, this is where his family is. And so I'm not really sure what the average Canadian would think of that story, but I do know that this man found kindness, this man found some peace in his life, and uh, yes, he has to abide by the laws of Canada and we do very good community supervision, but he feels like he has a family now. This is, this is a good point that you raise. And it, some people would suggest programs like yours, mm -hmm. kind of a get out of jail free card. People who are like, tough Absolutely. law and order, you know, you did the crime, you do the time, that's it. Okay, so yes, they all do the time. The punishment in our justice system is to take away a person's freedom. And absolutely, every person who goes to jail has no freedom whatsoever. While they're there though, if we want to prevent the reincarceration, then we have to do something meaningful. And I can tell you that the cost of incarceration is astronomically high. It's over $118,000 per year to keep a man incarcerated. And so why wouldn't we do this? If nothing but an economic benefit to Canada, why would we not invest in healing programs so that we um, do away with reincarceration and these men go out, get a job and pay taxes? It's a win-win for all mm. Canadians. It's not a get out, and this is hard work. 
And when you, uh, and that's one of the things about the graphic novel that we could show. Pete, this is the hardest thing he has ever done in his life, is to unpack his own history and figure out what the heck happened and, and make some good choices for himself. What do you want people to, to, to get out of reading The Outside Circle? Because it, it's very dense. There's a lot packed totally. in there. Well, number one, I want people to understand that um, uh, men in jail are not bad people. You know, they've done some pretty horrific things. Their, their actions have been bad. But we all start out as these beautiful children. We're all gifts from the Creator. And somehow, their life experience has shaped them to be what they are, violent men. Violent behavior is learned behavior. So if we can learn it, we can unlearn it. And the possibility for transformation exists with everybody. There's no throwaway people. Thank you for writing this book. It's, um, Thanks. We were talking just before we started, but you could have told this story in many ways and yeah. maybe had less impact. This is a very powerful book. Thank you for writing it. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.